Good evening, and welcome back to the Trinity Gardens Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study. We're delighted that you're with us tonight, and we welcome you from wherever you might be visiting with us. We know that many uh, of our local members are, are with us tonight, but we also welcome those who are beyond our local area, those who may be in other parts of the state of Texas, and even those who are beyond the state, we delight in your presence tonight and you're participating with our uh, Bible study. We're glad to have you. Uh, we're all looking forward to the time when we will be able to reassemble uh, back into our physical spaces of Bible study. We're hoping to, to do that in just a few weeks here at the Trinity Gardens Church. We will continue for the meantime uh, with our virtual Bible studies and there will be a period in which both our virtual Bible studies and our in-person Bible studies will run concurrently. So when we start back, which hopefully will be the first Wednesday of the month of June, next month, a few weeks, uh, we will continue with our virtual Bible study. So we encourage you to stay with us and to stay tuned. Uh, we are looking at the unfolding drama of the book of Job, looking at it as a theological book we're studying the nature of God in terms of Job's view of that nature, uh, Job's friend's view, and uh, uh, we'll even see others as we go throughout this study. This is the uh, ninth lesson in a 13-part series, uh, so we've already covered eight lessons. If you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you and encourage you to go to our Facebook page, the Trinity Gardens Church of Christ Facebook page or the Trinity Gardens Church of Christ YouTube channel and look into our archives on, of our Wednesday night Bible study and you can view at your own convenience and at your own pace the earlier eight lessons. So if you haven't done so, please do so. If this is your first time, we welcome you and you will be able to benefit and appreciate this lesson as a standalone lesson. We encourage you after you, you, you view this, hopefully in your small uh, groups or in your church houses, that you will spend the next uh, 35, uh, next 30 or so minutes uh, in your discussions and discernments as you look at your notes. We encourage you to take notes during our time together and what I call make notes, which is the one has to, taking notes has to do with what resonates with you making notes has to do with why it resonates with you. So during our time together, uh, make notes, just note those things that resonate with you, what resonates with you. After we are finished here, we encourage you to spend some time looking at why it resonates with you. And that's one of the reasons I encourage you to kind of fold your, your note page uh, vertically and, and put your take notes on one side and your make notes on the other. Let's pray tonight and get started. Uh, remember, we're, we're now looking at uh, meeting Job's friends. So we're in Act 2. We spent the first six weeks, in, in, uh, first six or seven weeks in Act 1, and, and now we're in Act 2. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for uh, those who are witnessing this experience virtually uh, tonight or perhaps at a later point in their, their time in life. But whoever might come to benefit from this. We give you praise and thanks. And we ask that you'll open our hearts and our minds that we'll be receptive and that we will receive with meekness your engrafted word which is able to save all of our souls. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so last week we, we were introducing Job's friends uh, uh, just by way of review. If you'll go to chapter two of the book of Job, let's read the uh, introduction again. Uh, chapter two, verse number 11. 12 and 13, I'm reading from the message translation. This is Job's friends who are now coming into the picture. That's why we call this Act 2. They are coming into the picture. They have come to visit their friend. Let's see what the Bible says. The Bible says, three of Job's friends heard of all the trouble that had fallen on him. Each traveled from his own country. Eliphaz from Tema, uh, Bildad from Shua, and Zophar from Namath and went together to Job to keep him company and comfort him. 
When they first caught sight of him, they couldn't believe what they saw. They hardly recognized him. They cried out in lament, ripped their robes and dumped dirt on their heads as a sign of their grief. Then they sat with him on the ground. Seven days and nights they sat there without saying a word. They could see how rotten he felt, how deeply he will suffer. I'm going to read that last line or two one more time. It says, seven days and night, they sat there without saying a word. They could see how rotten he felt, how deeply he was suffering. So Job's friends, after hearing about his suffering, because Job wasn't just having a bad day. This was more than a bad day. This had gone into a, a life cycle. Job was in despair. He had not only lost much of his wealth, he had now lost a significant portion of his health. And so his friends come to travel and to be with him and to share with him and to let him know that they are there for him. And last week, we, we, we talked about what friendship is. So Job has not only lost a significant portion of his wealth, but we see where he's lost a significant portion of his health. And so his life has spiraled, as we might say, out of control. And so friends, are coming to his rescue now. Remember last week we talked, uh, I shared with you two passages. One is Proverbs 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. So friendship is not defined by the good times of our life. True friendship is defined by the adversity of life or during the adversity of our life. Proverbs uh, chapter 18, verse number 24. Friends come and friends go but a true friend sticks by you like family. So remember last week we told you uh, friends, the true definition of a friend are those that we pick to be our family. And family are those we don't pick and we work to make sure they are friends. But friends are those you select. And be careful, as we mentioned last week, who you identify as your friends because they will have much to do with shaping your life. So we want to look now two things I mentioned last week they did. They came number one and they sat with Job in silence. Now we just read the passage and you saw they were overtaken in grief themselves. They, I, they did not even realize how severe their friend's condition was and so they they also went into a, a, a period of grief and, and sorrow upon witnessing and seeing his physical appearance and how it had deteriorated. But it's interesting because the Bible says that they sat with him for seven days without silence, without speaking rather, in silence. Now these are friends and there are times in our relationship when we are friends that words are not necessary. There are times in our life when we just need people to be there for us, not to explain things to us, not to justify things for us, and not to solve our problems. Sometimes during your high periods of grief or sadness or brokenness or disappointment, you just need friends who will be present with you. One, it encourages you to be present. But two, it brings them into a shared presence. Now, there are a couple of things that I want us to note about that. One is we, we often think about sharing conversation, conversation with our friends or doing something with our friends. But there is what's called shared silence. It requires no verbalization. It requires no talking, but it's shared because you come together oftentimes in the same place. And when you intimately love a person, 
you can share with them not only in conversation, but in silence. And so for seven days, and this is probably uh, unheard of many of us in our Western culture, because in our culture, everything is defined by what you do and what you say. We, we, we don't have the same level of appreciation that other parts in, of the world and other cultures do in, uh, of appreciating silence. So Job's friends, they, they, they realize he's in a bad place. And they're saying by their presence, we're with you. We're with you. And it's just shared silence. Is that we share in your grief, we share in your sadness. We don't necessarily have the answers. We simply want to be here with you during this your time of grief. And that's one reason we mentioned don't don't define your friends by who's around when you have plenty or who's around when life is good or who's around for the celebration or the party. But who's around when there is no celebration? There is no party. There is no plenty. That perhaps there's just sadness. And there's sometimes in our human life, folks, that we're just going to be sad. Even in our Christian human journey, there are times in life, there are events in life, and sometimes there are even periods in our life when we're sad and we still need our friends, especially those who are true friends. And so they came to share. One of the temptations we should seek to avoid is feeling like people always need us as a problem solver. Sometimes that's not what you need from a friend. You don't need the friend to even come in inquiring necessarily about what's wrong, what happened. Sometimes all that's just not what's important at the time. What's important at the time is to message by silence or by words that I'm here for you. And I'm not just here for you, I'm here with you. And maybe the only thing I can do with you is to help you bear this burden of grief. To know that I grieve with you, that I sympathize and empathize with where you are, that my love for you causes my pain. It's, it's, it, it, I was having a conversation with one of my daughters the other night and, 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 and we were talking about different things, but somehow the, the subject came up about what, what, what's, what's the tough part of, of rearing children. And, and one of the things that came to my mind is that anytime you see your child suffering, it's just terribly painful. I, I, you know, I, anytime my children, I remember one, one having to go uh, have day surgery, was not going to even be overnight, but to see my child in that place and knowing I couldn't take her place and I couldn't remove her pain and I couldn't. And sometimes you can't, friends, you can't, you can't remove anything. You can't fix anything. You can't write anything. You can't replace anything. And sometimes friendship just calls for what Joe's friends are doing here. Now I'm going to tear into these friends, but I'm going to really commend them right here because their first notion was to just be present and how we need friendships that help us, first of all, be present in our own life. Remember, we've been, we've been talking about being watchful or being mindful. You remember, speaking of grief period, you remember when Jesus was going through his great period of grief, as he was nearing the end of his life, and he knew that the time had come for him to go to the cross and to be crucified on behalf of all humanity. That was a period of great sadness and grief in his life. And let, let, let's just, let's, let's re revisit that passage. Look, look at uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. 
And, and this again is the life of Christ here. So we're going to leave Job for a minute here. Let's go to Matthew and look at verse number, excuse me, chapter 24. And let's look at verse number 42. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to visit back here tonight. All right, Matthew 24, 42. Let's go to the NIV translation here. All right. Now this is Christ doing his period of grief, and this is what we're talking about. Look at, look at verse number forty-two. It says, "Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this: if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming." He would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge? And, and, and oftentimes we, we, we think of this passage as the return of Christ. He's telling us to be mindful and watchful at all times. You don't know when he will come to your heart. You don't know when the thief will break in. If your mind is not guarded, if you are not mindful, if you are not attentive, then the thief will come in just like the thief came in on Judas. Judas was one of the 12. Judas had signed up for the mission, but his mind was unguarded, unprotected, and the thief came and prompted him, John 13, 2. Put it in his heart, the King James says, Put it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Now Judas' temptation made him susceptible to that. His mind was unguarded. Now turn to chapter 26 of Matthew, same book. Now we're going to look at Christ. Now he's at the end of his journey and he, he needs his friends. This time look at verse 41. This is Christ in the eve of the crucifixion. In verse 41, the Bible says, watch and pray. Well, let's back up. I want to back up. Let me back up. Look at verse number, verse number, let's start with verse number 38. It says in verse number 38, then he said to them, this is Christ speaking to the uh, those apostles that were with him. Then he said unto them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Sometimes, folks, in life we are sad. He says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. See, that's what Job's friends were doing. At that point, they were keeping watch with him. The Bible says in verse 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then verse 40 says, Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus, again, is talking about this need to be mindful. And during his periods of grief and sadness, even though the Lord had great understanding, he gave himself to being, to keeping focused, to keeping mindful of what his task was, what he had come to this earth to do. And so he was able to pray, even in the midst of that sorrow, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So sometimes friends need to just be there for us, but we need to resist the temptation to feel like we need to fix problems for everybody. Sometimes it's just not the thing to do or even to understand the problem. It doesn't always require us to go in seeking to understand, seeking to know what's going on. Tell me what's going on, child. Tell me what happened. Sometimes people just need friends who are not interested in being nosy, 
who are not interested in knowing what happened, who just know that you're sad, and that's enough for them to be sad. Because you're sad. Because your life is at a broken place, that breaks me. And sometimes I just need to, as we say about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, sometimes we just need people to come alongside of us and to sit with us. Now, beside needing people to do that, we need the ability to do that in our own life. To sometimes to sit with our feelings. I know we don't want to be sad. And we're always trying to figure out, and especially in this Western culture we're living in, how to get rid of the sadness. How to get rid of the boredom. How to get rid of the whatever we feel. You know, turn on the TV, turn on the radio, go somewhere, eat something, do something, see something. Because we don't want to often sit with our feelings. But that's part of what watching is. That's part of what mindfulness is. It's to become aware and to observe our feelings. Why am I feeling that? Where's that feeling coming from? What is the true meaning of that feeling? Lord, help me to understand. It's, it's, it's pulling up to the feeling. Those that are sad, those that are hard, it's not running from them. It's challenging ourselves to be still. That's why the Bible says be still and know that I'm God. Sometimes life demands for us to be still and to be sad. We can't not ever have sadness, even as a child of God. Jesus was sad. He was at this point, very sad. Even unto death. And so he went into a period of mindfulness. At least he failed to accomplish the mission. At least he failed to stay focused and not give in to Satan's prompting. You see, during this period, I'm talking about Christ now. I want to make this illustration. During these last days, when he's in this great emotional place, when there's great sorrow, Satan is looking for an opportunity to get in on him. He uses Peter one time. You remember when Jesus says to the twelve, I must go to Jerusalem to die as a ransom for the world. And Peter says, no, Lord, no, Lord. We will stand with you. We will protect you. We will stop this. And Jesus turns to him and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't respond to Peter because he knew who was prompting Peter. He was aware. He was alert of Satan's strategies. And so he was able to say, Not Peter, but Satan. Get behind so sometimes during moments of sadness and sorrow, we have to sit with our feelings. We have to sit with our emotions. We have to sit with our thoughts. And we have to try to observe and be aware and alert what's going on. And so his friends also had that practice. And so they came and they joined him. Now I know this is very anti-Western culture civilization, but it wasn't at this time. And it, it, it isn't even today in many Eastern cultures where people sit in silence for extended period of time. And so they came and for seven days they sat with him in silence. Now, they began to become weary, the friends, and this is the next, this is when I'm really going to tear into them. And, and they moved into our more Western culture response to, to trouble and sadness. Now they want to get to the root of the problem. Now they want to solve the problem. Now they want to tear into Job. So they sat with him in silence for seven days in comfort. But now they are going to move into what I call, they're going to sit with him in judgment. Now correction becomes more important than connection. Now rules become 
more important than relationship. And we, we, we all have to guard against the temptation to think that correcting people is more important than connecting to people. To think that the rule is more important than the relationship. And that's not to say that correcting and rules are not important, but when they supersede connecting, even with our children, it's more important for me to connect with my children than to correct my children when they were children. God reminds us, and we'll see in, in well, I'm out of time here, so I'm going to have to, but I want you to see how important it is for us to resist the temptation to correct over connect. And when we look at the life of Christ, we're going to look at the Gospel of John. When we look at the life of Christ, you're going to see that was a practice, a habit of his. Connecting was more important than correcting. Relationship, we, we're always wondering what, 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 what I need to do about so and so. Sometimes we just need to connect. God bless you. I look forward to next week. We'll pick up here. We'll look at uh, uh, Jesus and John chapter 4. We're going to talk about sitting with people in judgment and, and, and the overwhelming desire we have to judge. God bless you. May he keep you is my prayer. We'll see you next Wednesday.